So well, welcome back to the next part of our <laughs> conference program. And it gives me a special pleasure uh, at this point to um, introduce to you the, uh, this year's winner for the Oliver Barclay Lectureship. And that has gone to uh, Dr. Miriam Schilling, who is a virologist who's been working um, in this area at, at Oxford and is also currently um, studying theology for a doctorate in theology uh, with uh, Professor Alison McGrath. And so some of you may well have come across her writing. She's become a very prolific writer on the subject of the issue of uh, viruses as part of God's creation. And we are especially grateful to have had her providentially during this, this particular trying time for the world to help us understand the place of viruses in God's creation. Um, and so it gives me a special pleasure to uh, present um, our certificate uh, to Miriam. Perhaps you'd like to join me here. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the podium to Miriam, who will give her uh, Oliver Barclay Lecture for 2021. Thank you so much. Well, it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, be here and speak about viruses, which is my favorite subject. So you'll uh, see how I attempt um, to make some connections between viruses and the topic of today's conference, the climate crisis. Here we go. So um, for the last two years, or a year and a little bit, um, we've been thinking about virology quite a lot. When we watched the news, we were thinking about death rates, um, case numbers, hospitalization rates, and we thought about um, the effectiveness of the vaccine, how the programs rolled out, the policies in place. So I feel that was the main topic we had to deal with. But um, every once in a while in between, we've seen photos like this on the news as well. We've seen wildfires in all parts of the world. Um, we've seen devastating floods, especially in Europe. Um, this is a photo of one of the areas where I didn't live too far away for a long time um, in Rheinland-Pfalz. Um, we've seen hurricanes and all sorts of things. And um, for a long time, um, I felt most people were asking, why are these two madnesses um, coming together? Is there maybe a coincidence between both pandemics um, and um, all sorts of um, outbursts of the climate change? So I thought today um, I'll try to merge my favorite topic, virology, with your favorite topic, the climate change, and hope we'll come into some sort of discussion. So going back to the topic of virology. When we are thinking about pandemics, and with, when we are thinking about the last pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, how uh, do we think that happens? So um, what we know is that coronaviruses are prevalent in bats, which means there's a large um, amount of different coronaviruses spreading through bat populations, and at some point they'll, for whatever reason, find an intermediate host, and then from these intermediate hosts um, can jump species across to humans. And if that virus is fit enough, we'll see that it then also spreads through the human population. So for example, in 2013, we had the MERS coronavirus um, pandemic, and uh, you can see that was transmitted through a camel. It is still spreading in camels, so there's still cases around the world. In 2000. And three, a bit earlier, we had SARS coronavirus 1. Um, back in the days, there wasn't the one because it's the only one we had. Um, and we think that that was probably transmitted through the civet cat. And just about two years ago, um, it's rather unclear where that virus came from because we could find it in different sorts of mammals on animal markets. Um, it might have been a pangolin, but we're not quite sure about that yet. So there's this trajectory between um, uh, a source of viruses in a different species that then can cross over to humans. And this is, of course, not the case only for coronaviruses, but we are very familiar with that phenomenon in other sorts of viruses. So, for example, this is influenza virus, and you can see the reservoir for influenza viruses is mainly in aquatic birds, and then can spread through a whole range of different species, and at some point ends up in humans once in a while. 
And um, so this is just a list of um, pandemics we've, and epidemics we've come across in the last 20 years. Um, very famous, the H1N1 swine flu in 2009, where a new influenza strain emerged through swine to the human population. And we had a range of different avian influenza viruses coming, of course, through aquatic birds and poultry. And we've also seen it with Ebola. Um, this is um, just a, a simplification of um, what happens with Ebola. Similar principle, we have a reservoir in fruit beds, and at some point, either directly or indirectly through other species, um, Ebola is transmitted to human beings and then um, is circulating within our species. What do I want to say? I want to say that in the last 20 to 30 years, we've had We've seen many different epidemics um, or pandemics through different viruses that at some point crossed species into the human population. And you can see these are marked in green. These are newly identified um, emerging infections. The ones in red you can see are the ones that just change location, uh, pot potentially through a different species. Um, and uh, what you can see is that this is a 2019 <laughs> photo um, and map so, of course, when you now take into account the whole SARS-Coronavirus-2, you will see just a, a very blue um, map. So that's less interesting. Um, what do all of these things have in common? Um, as I said, there are different species with different um, viruses circulating. And from these species, we'll sooner or later see the viruses um, jumping species. Um, how they do this um, is very different. It takes the virus to adapt to a new host machinery because, as we've all learned, viruses need a host to replicate, so they need to learn how to use our cellular system, and at the same time, they also need to be able to cope with our immune system because we also will have an immune reaction to a virus, and if they cope with both systems, then they can be successful in the human population. It's a very interesting case for most viruses because, of course, they gradually acquire mutations and at some point they're fit enough to match our system. Um, it is especially interesting for flu because flu has a segmented genome, which means it can, if two different flu viruses infect the same um, host, they can also swap segments. And that's why there we see a bigger challenge in terms of how to vaccinate against the virus, but also um, potentially more different viruses coming um, so often. Right, so is there a coincidence um, about how these pandemics develop and the climate change? Um, and because I asked this question, probably my answer is yes. So I um, just want to make the point that um, both the climate change and pandemics are basically uh, a result of similar pressures. So through industrialization, industrialization, globalization, and increasing world population, we've had pressures on ecosystems um, that will then either end up in changes of the climate, and we've heard a lot about this today, which changes manipulate what and what we can do against that, but also put pressures on ecosystems that then come closer and make it more likely that pandemics can spread. So I'm not an expert on climate change at all, so I'm really thankful that we have heard some interesting speakers uh, with more insights. But what I can tell you is what virologists notice, that um, there are three things happening. Namely, you have a reduced species diversity in ecosystems if you put too much pressure on them, and that increases the chance for a virus to quickly adapt. If there are more species in an ecosystem, it's much harder for the virus to um, yeah, gain fitness quicker. If we destroy ecosystem, that also forces animals out of their habitats much closer into ours, which makes it more likely that we also get to see the viruses they bring. And of course, um, a very obvious um, thing we need to think about is how do we produce the masses of food that we consume? Because depending on how we do this, there's a bigger risk of virus adaptation and transmission. So um, we need to think about animal markets, we need to think about um, animal husbandry. Um, there's all sorts of very practical applications here. And these are just three examples. So, oh, sorry. 
So one take-home message when we think about um, pandemics and when we think about climate change was articulated by Jürgen Moltmann, and I'll quickly read this to you. So he said, we shall not be able to achieve social justice without justice for the natural environment, and we shall not be able to achieve justice for nature without social justice. For the pattern of exploitation, exploitation, exploitation has dominated both human labor and the resources or wealth of nature. Justice is the form of, of authentic interdependence between people and between society and the environment. And uh, listening to earlier talks, I feel this is a very good summary of what we've heard, where social justice and knowledge about environment are coming together, and I think it also fits virology. Um, if you like a more catchy um, summary of, of that, you can also go with your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, who says, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So this is a very broad statement, uh, but nevertheless um, very true. Right. So uh, the point I made uh, just now is that there are different factors that will contribute to how viruses spread. So one, of course, is the biological factors, the, the features a virus brings, how it looks genetically, so flu is different than coronavirus, um, and of course it depends a bit on the host, so, and we've seen this the last two years, how different age groups and different risk factors change how you're infected, uh, more easily than if you have a different age group or a different um, yeah, immune status. So um, there are biological factors and certain host um, factors. But as I've just pointed out, there are also human, social and behavioral factors. So it does matter what we do, how we treat animals, how, we, how much we deforest um, our forests um, or not. So we can influence quite a lot in the way pandemics develop. And um, interestingly, and also logically, there's also um, environmental factors. So um, we're moving topic now. So I've, I've looked at how, um, how the source of both pandemics and the climate change are coming from similar pressures. And now we're thinking a bit with the climate change. So what happens with climate change and the development of pandemics and the spread of viruses? So we are going um, a bit further. So what happens? A very obvious example what can happen is that, of course, you have viruses that rely on so-called vectors. These are archipod-born viruses that transmit through mosquitoes, um, through ticks, sandflies, midges, etc. Um, and that, that's quite easy to understand. So these are viruses that are very happy in both the human system and, for example, in the mosquito system. And what they can do is they can basically use um, that vector to infect the next host. So there are more than 500 known arboviruses, and of which about 100 can cause disease in human. Some of my favorites are dengue virus, West Nile virus, Zika virus, chikungunya virus. So when we're thinking about climate change, uh, we also have to think about um, habitats of animals. So if, if we have more and more um, weather changes, of course, different animals will migrate to different places. And um, that also means that, for example, mosquitoes will change their habitats. So uh, no worries, this is the worst case scenario. So of course, researchers are trying to estimate um, and to show what, what's the outcome of the worst case scenario. If we have increasing and increasing and increasing emission over time, you can see that that's the current status, so you can see um, where different species of mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, are currently present. And if you then go down in time for the next 50, 100 years, you can see how a change um, in their habitats occurs with increasing, increasing emission and the temperature shifts that come along. And you can see that for different regions and also for different mosquitoes, it's quite different. So I'm not going to say it's going to be worse everywhere. You can see that. As a European, we'll, we'll probably see more mosquitoes coming up because it's getting warmer over here. Whereas, for example, um, Aedes albopictus in the South Americas, they'll be less present um, because the climate changes differently over there. So uh, when we're thinking about viruses that come along with vectors, we need to um, understand how the vector is moving with the changing climate. That was an easy example. 
So now it's getting more complicated, and I already apologize to all the marine biologists out there because I only have a very rough understanding of how the ecosystem ocean works. So the complicated thing with the ocean is that it covers about 70% of the world's surface. That means um, that it can, um, can absorb or can, has the capacity to store uh, more than a thousand times the heat than the atmosphere does. So um, the oceans will massively be impacted by climate change. The oceans not only store heat, they also store salt and distribute salt. Um, the oceans, of course, are host to a ton of different species. Um, the oceans um, have ice melting or non-melting. The, the oceans have currents that are flo floating around. Um, the oceans have cyanobacteria, which we've heard earlier about, which are responsible for about 50% of the world's oxygen supplies. So you have all sorts of things going on in the ocean. And with the climate change, of course, all of this is affected. So you will have changes in the intensity and distribution of storms. You will have water levels rising. The temperature will change. Acidification will change. Um, and probably um, yeah, the range of animals living in the ocean will also change or their distribution. So what does that have to do with viruses? The thing is that we know very little about viruses in the ocean. But what we know is, A, of course, there are viruses in the ocean and there are very many of them, and we haven't explored them in much depth. So estimations um, assume that there are about 15 times more viruses in the ocean than there are bacteria in archai, um, which means um, they are the biggest entity in the ocean. And it also means that um, when you just roughly estimate how much of a weight they produce, like if you think about the carbon in um, viruses, um, they are about the weight of 75 million blue whales. So that's the amount of viruses we're dealing with in the ocean. So what do they do in oceans? Um, and that's also barely studied. So of course they infect all sorts of bacteria and animals, and they have different jobs. So um, you can see there are lots of um, arrows pointing in all sorts of directions. Um, when a virus infects an animal or a bacterium, at some point it might or might not die. So viruses basically um, have an impact on not only the diversity within oceans, but also um, the amount per population, depending on how much or how fast a virus is spreading within these populations. Viruses have a very important job when it comes to making nutrients available again. So by the amount of um, plankton that dies, they make nutrients from that plankton available for all other species before it actually sinks to lower um, areas of the ocean, so it's a bit like a recycling system. Um, we have seen uh, viruses that are infecting these cyanobacteria that are important for oxygen production, and we know that these viruses also have genes that can help with photosynthesis, and it's quite unclear how much they help or just gain that from the cyanobacteria, but there's an interplay there. Um, the oceans also store a lot of um, carbon dioxide, that's a very important cycle the oceans are also involved in. And um, bacteria, by the, by just by the ratio in which they kill or not kill certain species, um, help with that cycle. So the complex thing with the ocean is that the ocean is affected by climate change, but the ocean is also determining the output of climate change for all other ecosystems because of the weather it determines the um, carbon dioxide it, it, it can absorb, and all sorts of things. And so when you're now thinking about viruses, and I think that's one of the major challenges uh, to understand what viruses actually do in the ocean, because they're currently not thought of when you think about climate change. And actually in all these models about how climate change affects other ecosystems and how um, the change in the ocean will affect other ecosystems, the viruses aren't, aren't thought of. And it's highly complicated to think of um, and there are different models accompanying different scenarios in, in which way a virus might help against climate change, it, in which ways it might make it worse. So I've just put a lot of question marks. How will the availability of nutrients change, for example, if, I don't know, let's say the, the surface levels rise or the water becomes a bit warmer or less warm um, because by the change within the host species, there are different viruses around and they will change things. The same about diversity. 
because viruses are involved in also pushing for genetic diversity because they bring more genetic material, all of that may change as well. Um, they help um, with, probably help with photosynthesis. Um, it will change how algal blooms um, are terminated. So there's all sorts of things and viruses are in the middle of that. So the climate change will affect hosts, will affect viruses, and they will affect hosts and that will affect climate. So there's, you know, this two-way street. Um, and I hope we'll learn more in the future. Um, so the point I've made is um, we have um, pandemics and um, climate change coming through similar pressures and we have an effect on cli of climate change on viruses. And um, I, th I hope with the ocean example, you also saw that viruses are not just in an antagonistic relationship with their host, they're actually also helping um, to maintain diversity of populations, they help um, shape populations, um, they help, help with the evolution. And for example, with plant biology, you see a whole lot of very interesting examples of how viruses um, are actually helping them um, for example, there are interesting studies with rice um, and viruses infect and making them more stable against heat, for example, or drought. So um, there's also a lot of mutualistic relationships between viruses and hosts, probably a, a whole lot of commensal, where there's just no, no benefit or, um, or problem with viruses, and there are some biogenic um, relationships. So the last point I want to make is that viruses have shaped the world we live in um, in quite an uh, amount that we can't even estimate because viruses have been around ever since we can think. Uh, virologists aren't quite sure about um, where viruses come from, but we're pretty sure that they've been around since there was life, either because they were a prerequisite to life by being replicating elements or by developing from protocells or fully working cells um, by becoming independent replicating systems. So they've been around and they've put um, pressure um, onto our system and provided new genetic material. So for example, this paper claims that very conservatively, um, they estimate that about 30% of all adaptive mutations that are conserved in mammals would uh, probably come through the pressure of viruses, because as I said, viruses need to adapt to the cell system, to all the machinery we have, and to the immune system in our cells. So both systems will be affected and most cellular pathways um, will have been shaped by viruses. There are of course also viruses that integrate into genomes and so over time we've, accumulating, we've accumulated these elements in our DNA and about 40%, that's almost half of our DNA, um, comprises elements that are so-called retrotransposons and then can probably do all sorts of things for us. So here's a list, please don't read it. So we see this in all, all other species as well, that we have viruses with us that have been around a long time in the evolutionary process. One example is this. This is called syncytine 1, which is a very famous example where uh, human cells basically make use of a protein that once belonged to a virus. And the virus, it was used for fusion with the cell, and in our cells, it can now help with cell-cell fusion, and it's very important for the formation of the placenta. So that's quite a crucial um, element. And um, here, that's a very busy slide. You can see these two round dots in the middle every once in a while, called RAC1 and 2. These are two proteins that we also have from a viral infection, and uh, in this case, they are helping with the formation of um, either antibodies or T cell, B cell receptors because they are needed for what you can see here. It's a reshuffling between V, D and J segments. So parts of our genome that need to be rearranged to maintain a specific response to get against the pathogen. I igno ignore the, the slide um, just as a notion. These are important for our immune system and we got them from viruses. And the last example, um, if viruses integrate into our genome, they're not, of course, only bringing the proteins the virus had, but all these regulatory elements, because viruses need to regulate things as well. And um, it is thought that um, human cells can make use of these regulatory elements and, uh, for example, use them because they get duplicated and duplicated to use the same element to regulate a whole network of things. 
So imagine you come home in the evening, you press one button, and at the same time, um, you start the kettle, um, your lamps turn on, your door shuts, and you're heating your bed with your blanket, whatever. So you do, you do a whole lot of range of things just with one, one button. Um, so that would be the, the beauty of using regulatory elements from viruses for networks. Right. I hope that all made uh, slightly sense for you. Um, I hope I could draw some biological, biological connections. Um, first of all, by showing that there is um, a connection between the climate crisis and pandemics, that there's also a connection between ecosystems and that viruses um, come through different ecosystems and shape how, virus, how uh, ecosystems can interact. And viruses are also a link between us and the rest of the living and even non-living world. Um, so a biological conclusion would be that um, healthy ecosystems slow down adaptation and spill over viruses, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, but they also fulfill very important roles in ecosystems, and if we destroy the ecosystem, this will call, cause an imbalance um, as well. Um, and our decisions for the future will make an impact, as I think the bottom line here. And I also hoped and promised uh, that we can make some theological conclusions uh, for the future. And I think, or I hope what I gain from learning more about viruses, that they help us um, show, or they, they show us the importance of understanding who we are. So the first thing is we are part of ecosystems and we are connected with them and the result of what happened in these ecosystems through evolution. So there's a whole range of discussions that we can think through when it comes to evolution and human identity, uh, who we are biologically but also theologically because, um, and I haven't discussed this much further, viruses show us how the um, biological definitions of life are very limited and um, that there's probably not a straight line between non-living and living, but that through theology there's a, a perspective coming from the outside towards us um, that defines life in a different way. So um, I think bringing together biology and showing the limitations um, enables us to connect it with the theology and, and show the implications and um, the worth and the value that we have coming through the Bible and through God's word. Um, spoken to us. Um, a second thing is that we have uh, responsibility to steward this world, and I think um, biologically as well as theologically we can see that we have this responsibility, because as Spiderman said, with great power comes with great responsibility, and I think biologians as well as theologians would agree on that. Um, I hope I can also show that the topic of natural evil is a bit more complicated um, than it looks at first glance because um, many of the things that we call natural evil actually are quite important and have valuable functions for the world we are in. If you're more interested in that, um, you can look up my published paper on that. And I also hope that it potentially can, can help us tackle the topic of suffering in a different way and hopefully also pastorally in a different way in the future. Um, also important, I think I also showed that there is much more to be discovered. Um, as natural scientists as well as, as theologian, there's much more to do and understand these connections. Um, and I think as a personal question, uh, I want to ask how do we as Christians engage with the natural sciences, either as scientists or as theologian or as a lay person? And last thing, uh, if you're a German speaker, you can read up more about all of my thoughts in my book. If you're an English speaker, I'm very sorry, but if you know a publisher, I'm happy to trans translate it in the future. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, yeah, it was a great joy to summarize this. Miriam, thank you for a wonderfully clear, coherent, and comprehensive talk on, on a wonderfully interesting and really compelling topic. Thank you very much. Uh, we've all learned an enormous amount from, from your lecture, and we'll go on learning by reading uh, things that you've been writing. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, a worthy winner, I'm sure you'll all agree. So. Um,
we wouldn't be having uh, a proper conference if we didn't allow the timetable to slip a little bit during the day. And so we've slipped a little bit, so we're just going to move quickly on to um, our next topic that we're squeezing in here, which is an update um, on um, some of the developments um, within Christians in Science. One of the more unfortunate developments um, has been the announcement that our beloved General Secretary Diana Briggs is retiring this year. Um, and we've been flagging up this um, very sad event for the last uh, number of months. So um, uh, really it's, it's with great sadness, but also with great sense of, of gratitude, Dan, and I want to say a big thank you on behalf of Christians in Science, not just for myself and my own generation, but for the folk who've been with you on this journey over the past decade and a half nearly, really. And uh, as part of the... Uh, evidence of Diana's commitment to Christians in Science that she's been this thread of, of coherence and consistency um, through the last decade and a half and that's been of enormous value to Christians in Science during that time. Uh, I certainly uh, felt um, the benefit of Diana's support when I became chair just two years ago um, and Diana was just a constant source of information of gentle uh, guidance and great wisdom. Um, every organization has what they call an institutional memory. And we've been privileged to have a beautiful institutional memory in the form of Diana. And um, she's very graciously uh, agreed to be on hand in the coming uh, months and years uh, if we need um, uh, some information of what we did in, in 10 years ago about this topic and didn't somebody say something about this? Diana will know the answer. Um, so Diana, we want on behalf of uh, Christians in Science just to give you a little token of our appreciation and I think Mary is going to come up. Um, will you come up, Diana? And we're going to do this in public. <laughs> You didn't think that all you were going to get was flowers, was it? <laughs> well, you happen to know that you came by car um, and that you might be able to take a little um, bigger token of our appreciation. And I'm sure that um, you'll find something uh, suitable to enjoy the contents of this crate <laughs> with Andrew. So um, I'm not going to hand it over to you, um, but we'll uh, make sure it gets delivered safely to your car. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. Can I just say how, how much fun it's been being part of CIS and it's really a big wrench to leave. Um, so I wish you all well for the future and I hope to keep in touch. But also, um, I think you'll find Gavin is an absolutely wonderful replacement. He's, he brings all sorts of special gifts and I think he'll do very well. So I, I wish him well too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diana. So do you see what I mean? My next job was to announce that Gavin Merrifield was going to be our new General Secretary, but Dan has done it already. She's always one step at the end of the game. <laughs> so we are delighted to announce, as Diana says, that Gavin Merrifield, who's been active in Christians and Science for a number of years and one of the uh, leading lights in the Manchester group, um, is going to take on the role of General Secretary from the day that Diana hands over. And so, Gavin, we are immensely grateful to you uh, for taking on this role, and we look forward to working with you in the years ahead. So, um, that concludes our CIS update. Um, and so, we're going to move on to the next part of our programme which is a, a one minute break, and then we'll have our, our next talk from um, Merrick Sorox. So that will be in about one minute's time. Join us then.